progress. Good morning, brothers and sisters. As we open up this gift from our Heavenly Father, let us thank him for his blessing and ask him to join with us in this meeting. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have of opening your word. We thank you for your guidance, for your direction, and for showing us that which is needed to prepare us for the work that is yet to come. Help us, Father, today. Hide us in your word so that your character and that which you would have to be understood may be displayed to all that attend and view this meeting. Help us now to this end. Direct us. In these things, we lift up also Heidi and Theodore and those that have not been able to join with us this week. We ask you, Father, for, their, for blessings upon them, for your watch care upon them. Help them to know that they are cared about and that they are missed. Be with us now, each one. For this, we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, yesterday we left off at, Dan, all right, at Joshua 1940, which is before you on the screen. Now, Sister Angela, would you please continue in this study and let us take a look at what we find here in this portion of the book of Judges, or Joshua, excuse me. Okay, so Dan is the judge, and to plead the cause, uh, verse 41, Zora means wasp. An Ishtel entreaty <coughs> and Irshemish city of the sun. Do you do you derive any symbolic meaning that Dan was the one that received the seventh lot of the children of Dan or of children of, of Israel? Well, I know seven has great importance, like completion. I mean, God sending wasps would be a judgment for sure. If people are living in the city of the sun, if, they, if they're worshiping on the wrong Sabbath, so-called Sabbath, they receive the papal mark. Okay. Uh, Irshemish can also mean a watch or sun rising or the east. So when I hear East, I think of Islam. And verse 42, shall, shall Robin foxholes. And Agilon is a deer field. And Jethro. Uh, something about hanging, like a gibbet. Okay, now... Well, I'm totally puzzled by this one. <laughs> Shalabin, the foxhole. Does that bring up any, any other connotations from what, uh, what we've seen in other portions of the Bible? Well, I know Herod was called the fox. And Jesus said, foxes have holes and, you know, the birds have nests, but I have nowhere to lay my head. So maybe it's just a calling to these, these strangers and pilgrims in okay. our walk with God. But did not Samson do something with foxes as far as... Uh, oh, yeah. Set fire to the, the Philistine fields, right? They well, he... Stick fire. Did, Torches did, tied to their tails or something? He tied two foxes' tails together and put torches between them. Okay. 
So as the foxes ran trying to get away from the fire, they ran doing destruction upon the Philistines. Well, that's an interesting, a really fascinating way of doing war, I guess. <laughs> well, okay. Okay, go ahead. Well, regarding uh, just, just law about hanging, well, I know that Haman's 10 sons were hanged and so were Saul's, right? Okay. That's to remind us of that. The dangers of, of of rebelling rebelling against God. The meaning I have for Jethro is he will exalt it, meaning God will exalt it. Okay. Oh, totally different. <clears throat> I find this interesting with this city because here is the seventh lot. Seven being the number. I believe we would we would have to say of perfection. The seventh also being the number of rest. Here is this inheritance that is given to Dan. As we continue through this, and as we had we had addressed at, at a point, the original inheritance of Dan would have included some areas that later we came to understand were Philistine cities. Dan was the one that chose not to completely drive out any of the Canaanites. And they went further north to take part of a territory that had been conquered by somebody else. So did they lift up God? Did they fulfill Jethla in the way that they approached their inheritance? Now, when I was thinking earlier this morning, because Dan spurned what God had, had, had given them, they were left out of, you know, like in Revelation, it doesn't even, even include them. It's like well, scorning your birthright. Right, exactly. <clears throat> In Dan, we are shown one of the judges. Dan should have been one of the mightier ones, but Dan turned their back upon what God would have them to do. So please continue. Now you were saying that that Elon had what meaning? Uh, an oak grove. Okay. And Timnath's uh, portion assigned. And I've got a whole bunch of scribbles, and then I have uh, enroll, appoint, count, and prepare. And for Ekron to fold or duplicate, to double or to return. Oh, not quite sure what to make of that. Well, <clears throat> okay. I mean, returning can do with, can have something to do with repentance, of course. But what else, <clears throat> what else do we know about Ekron? Well, I've heard the name, I read the name, but I don't remember. <laughs> it was the city of the Philistines. It was one of the five cities oh. of the Philistines. Right? Yes. So 
if if I was looking at this strictly from Strong's, and there would be possibly other uh, definitions given in Strong's, Ekron could mean emigration or torn up by the roots or eradication. Wow. Now, if a plant is torn up by the roots, does the plant survive? Not for long. So I look at this with Ekron. Here were Ekron, Gath, and three other cities that should have been of the inheritance of the children of Israel but were not because they chose not to believe that God was capable of doing what he promised he would do. Now, what does that say for us today? Well, the same rule applies. We have to have faith to proceed. Exactly. Okay. What did you find on El Taka? That's just it. I don't have anything there, but Strong supposedly has a definition, which I'm trying to find right now. It says of uncertain derivation. Well, that's a big help. I know the L refers to God. Okay. Well, Brown Driver Briggs would, sh would share that as let God spew thee out. Oh, wow. That's referring to Laodicea for sure. <clears throat> Especially if we're looking at this and we are lukewarm. Yep. So let me ask you a question. Was Dan lukewarm about their inheritance? Obviously. Why would they go to steal someone else's and not fight yeah. for their own? It, it, is it any different from what we've seen from <clears throat> the pen of Uriah Smith or in history up through 1957 within the church? Hmm. I mean, is this not the ultimate result of the Laodicean condition. Okay. I have to step away for just a second. I will be right back, but please continue. Okay. Give us on or give us on a hilly spot and Baal is mistress ship. So Baal is, I guess, could be uh, referring to a church also. So we have a Laodicean church on a hilly spot, which has mistress ship in a worldly sense, I suppose. That was in verse 44 and verse 45 as Jehu celebrated, revered, worship, and give thanks. So that has a good connotation. And Ben of Barak, sons of lightning. Uh, reminds me of uh, James and John being the sons of thunder. Flashing sword, a glittering sword. Yeah, that's the same name as Barak that we find in Judges chapter 4. Right. 
So it's just another like a time time of different way of spelling Barak. But it, the, the meaning is the same. Mm -hmm. And Gath Rimen, again, the wine press. Wine press of something or other. Can't read my writing. I scribble it so quickly. Uh, verse 46, Majarka, water of yellow, like yellow water, like urine. That doesn't sound very good. And uh, Rakham, thinness again, or to spit. Could again be referring to light of the sea, I suppose. And Jaff, Jaffal, bright and beautiful. All things bright and beautiful, all things white and wonderful. <laughs> Verse 47, uh, Lishem adjacent. So that's one of the foundations of, 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 of the holy city. Uh, why did I skip verse 48? Okay, so fill me in, please. Well, <laughs> we went through uh, the meanings of Jehud, which is celebrated and revered and, and, and to worship. And Benabarak meaning so sons of, of, of lightning. And Stephen pointed out that that's uh, referring to Judges 4, about Barak. And Gath Rimen was wine press. There's a little more of that meaning, but I can't even read my writing, so I just. So Gath, Gath Ramon is the wine press. Okay. Okay, so why is wine press important? Oh, no, in Re Revelation talks about, about the wicked being trodden down as grapes. Right. Okay, but um, what about Gideon? Okay. Where was he threshing his wheat? By the wine press. And when you're by a wine press, what do you normally produce? wine and wine is a symbol of doctrine so if this is the wine press is this not the doctrine that is coming from the laodicean from el teka Oh, that's a good point. Okay. So that's that that's what we're seeing here in 1945. And that's the questions that come up on this part of it. So as we, as we segue into 1946. Yeah, Majorca means water, like it's, it's, it's like urine. So it's, the church is just excreting waste. <laughs> Maybe that's what it's referring to. Okay. And rack on uh, thinness or to spit. Well, a lot of excretions here. And Jaffo to be to be bright or or, or beautiful. So that's the contrast for sure. So we have Mejarkan or the waste and Rakon, the expectorate, with the border over against Jaffo or 
as could be translated Japa. Hmm. Do we know of anything else that came from Japa? If I remember correctly, it's referred to in, in the book of, of Jonah. Didn't he catch a okay. ship from there? I believe he did. To escape God's will, though. Now, what's interesting when you when you take a look at this. Jaffa is also known as, as we're seeing here as Jaffo. But currently it would also be noted as being Jaffo Tel Aviv. Oh, okay, the Hill of Spring. Okay. Now, the other thing from, the, from history Antiochus IV Epiphanes landed his army with plans to enforce the Hellenization of Jerusalem, where later he plundered the temple. Judas Maccabeus burned the harbor, but the city was too strong to be captured. <clears throat> so this became a port city that was important in the intertestament period. Okay, so let's continue. Okay, <clears throat> verse 47, Lishem means, means Jason, which I said was one of the foundations of, of the heavenly city. So there's nothing bad about the name, apparently. But, uh, but the Danites renamed it Dan. Okay, but let's, let's look at this entire verse. And the coast or the border of the children of Dan went out too little for them. Therefore, the children of Dan went up to fight against Leshem and took it and smote it with the edge of the sword, and possessed it, and dwelt therein, and called Lashem Dan after the name of Dan their father. Let us recall that the children of Dan were given a territory that was north of Judah, and it was to the west of Ephraim. So we're talking more toward the south. Lashem, which they renamed Dan, was one of the furthest north cities and was substantially above the Sea of Galilee. So this verse is being kind to what Dan did it's not saying however that they chose to reject their inheritance and took from the inheritance of naphtali we have 18 cities that are listed in the inheritance of dan before we get to Lashem. There are 19 total cities that are shown in this particular passage. Now in Joshua 19.48, this is the inheritance of the tribe of the children of Dan, according to their families, these cities and their villages. So, Rather than staying on the coast, rather than accepting their inheritance, as did Manasseh and as did Asher, Dan chose 
to go further north and every one of the nations that were around them in the north were idolatrous. Now, in the next in the next three verses, is there anything interesting about this part of the passage? What do you see here? Well, when they had made an end of dividing the land for inheritance by their coasts, the children of Israel gave an inheritance to Joshua, the son of Nun, among them. So he waited till they had all gotten their allotments and then they gave him his. Okay. <clears throat> so here's a question for you. How many individuals have we so far seen were called out to receive their inheritance. I know the chiefs of the tribes were, but I haven't been counting everybody. Well, the chiefs of the tribes were receiving this for the families, for everything else. Yeah, so how many people were involved? I have no idea. There's thousands. How many individuals' names have been presented so far as receiving a direct inheritance? Well, there would there'd be about 12, right? Or 13. Just making a comment. I was thinking. Was it just Joshua and Caleb? <clears throat> okay. There we have two. Let us remember there were five daughters that were called oh, by yeah. name. So you have a total <clears throat> of seven individuals by name receiving an inheritance. So you have Joshua and Caleb, Noah, Hogla. I mean, I, I can't remember all of the daughters, but seven in total. <clears throat> so according to the word of the Lord, they gave him the city, which he asked, even Timnath Sirah in Mount Ephraim. And he built the city and dwelt therein. These are the inheritances which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers of the tribes of the children of Israel divided for an inheritance by lot in Shiloh before the Lord at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. So they made an end of dividing the country. Now, the verses that were being given reference for Timnath Sarah, if we take this. We would have Joshua 24 30, and they buried him in the border of his inheritance in Timnath Sarah, which is in Mount Ephraim on the north side of the hill of Geish. And then, and his daughter was Shirah, who built Beth Haran, the nether, and the upper, and Uzen. Shira. So there's Timnath Shira and Uzen Shira. And I have to wonder if they are not giving reference to exactly the same city. Now, one of the things that I found interesting in putting this together in, in preparing for this part of the study. When we come to the portion here that references Joshua in 1947, 
that the, the coast or the border of the children of Dan went out too little, little for them. The translators gave reference that we should see Judges 19, the entire chapter. It's not often. Yeah, judges 18. Ju okay, excuse me, you're right. Judges 18. So thank you for correcting me. In this situation, it's not often that the translators give reference back to an entire chapter. We've covered Judges 18 in the past. And there are some other points about this that we will be addressing as we progress through the book of Joshua. But it gives a very interesting reference to why this in Joshua is tied directly with Judges 18. Now, we've come to this point where these items, these divisions have been given. I was led to start looking yesterday at the number of cities that are listed on each tribe. I've come to a point where it's interesting for me because I can't make out completely the number of cities from Joshua 17 that were granted to Manasseh. I did find it interesting when I went through team that 112 cities were noted as being given to Judah. I'll take a further look at this. I may send this out and just you know ask. I would like some additional input on some of these points because it's it's intriguing to me as to how all of this is listed and being put together. So, sister, do you have any other thoughts here in Joshua 19? Um, not right now. Okay. Okay. So now, The balance of our time today, we will turn over to Brother Stephen, who has prepared the study on Joshua 20. So, Stephen, the floor is yours. Okay, so we'll just read through uh, the chapter, and then we'll go over it. It's quite short, it's only nine verses. So the verse one says, The Lord also spake unto Joshua, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, Appoint out for you cities of refuge, whereof I spake unto you by the hand of Moses, that the slayer that killeth any person unawares and unwittingly may flee thither, and they shall be your refuge from the avenger of blood. And when he that doth flee unto one of those cities shall stand at the entering of the gate of the city, and shall declare his cause in the ears of the elders of that city, they shall take him into the city unto them, and give him a place that he may dwell among them. And if the avenger of blood pursue him, then they shall not deliver the slayer up into his hand, because he smote his neighbor unwittingly and hated him not before time. And he shall dwell in that city until he before the congregation for judgment and until the death of the high priest that shall be in those days. Then shall the slayer return and come unto his own city and unto his own house, unto the city from whence he fled. And they appointed Kadesh in Galilee, in Mount Naphtali, and Shechem in Mount Ephraim, and Kerbeth Jarba, 
which is a, which is Hebron in the mountain of Judah, and the and on the other side of Jordan, by Jericho eastward, they assigned Bezer in the wilderness, upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben, and Ramoth Gilead, or Gilead, out of the tribe of Gad, and Golan and Bashan out of the tribe of Manasseh. These were the cities appointed for the children of Israel and for the stranger that sojourneth among them, that whosoever killeth any person unawares might flee thither and not die by the hand of the avenger of blood until he stood before the congregation. Uh, so we find these cities of refuge being spoken of first um, in Numbers chapter 35. Uh, verses 10 to 28. And I think we've pretty much, um, we may not need to, to read it all because Judges 20 is really just like a, a brief on these here verses. Uh, there's maybe a wee bit more detail here. Um, I just sort of included it in there anyway, just to sort of uh, to have in the, in the study. Okay. I have a question for you. You're saying that that this Numbers 35 is the first reference to this? Well, I'm um, just sort of, is it not? Is there a... could, could we take a look at Exodus 21, verse 13? Well, I could be wrong in that. Okay, as I have it up, and if a man lie not in wait, but God deliver him into his hand, then I will appoint thee a place whither he shall flee. Right, okay. So it's mentioned in there, the city of refuge, but it's not actually specifying the, the actual city. Right. But it's saying it's going to be made, that provision. Correct. So in, in Numbers 35, we have a, a very specific delineation beginning with Moses because verses 6, 11, and 14 go through much of what Moses was commanding. So verse six reads, and among the cities which ye shall give unto the Levites, there shall be six cities for refuge, which ye shall appoint for the manslayer, that he may flee thither, and to them ye shall add 40 and two cities. So these are the cities that are given to the Levites, 42 cities, which is six times seven. are not cities of refuge, but six are cities of refuge. So all of these cities are given to the Levites, right? Mm -hmm. Now 35.11, then you shall point you cities to be cities of refuge for you, that the slayer may, may flee thither, which killeth any person at unawares. And verse 14, ye shall give three cities on this side of the Jordan, and three cities shall ye give in the land of Canaan, which shall be cities of refuge. These cities were divided. You had three to the east of the Jordan. You had three to the west of the Jordan. And then we find... Deuteronomy 19.2 and 19.9. Verse 2, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for to possess it. And then verse 9, if thou shalt keep all these commandments to do them, which I command thee this day to love the Lord thy God and to walk ever in his ways, then shalt thou add three cities more for thee beside these three. 
Yes. So Moses is reminding them of the blessings and the curses of Leviticus 25 and 26. If you shall keep all these commandments. Yes. So please continue. Okay, so uh, scroll down. Okay. Other way. So we've. So this is like a map. Right. Where these cities were. Now you have Kadesh there in Naphtali, near a lake. There, yep. Yeah. And then Golan in East Manasseh. Right. Uh, so, yeah, so in Ramoth Gilead. So that was part of Gad. And then um, in the west, again, west uh, Manasseh, you have Shechem. Uh, it says it's uh, Mount Ephraim. Shechem is Mount Ephraim, and there that map has west Manasseh. And I was kind of questioning, was Manasseh, um, should it not have been in Ephraim rather than in Manasseh? And then... Um, I think we were covering a passage, I think it was chapter 17, you were reading about, about it. Right. And it mentions Manasseh being connected with Mount Ephraim. I'm so, thinking, I, I'm thinking the way that this map is laid out, may that the um, Shechem may have actually been part of Ephraim. Because as, as I looked at the other verses, preparing for this study, it would seem that one city, Golan, was being given to Manasseh, and this one for Shechem was being in Ephraim, so that both of the sons of Joseph had received a sanctuary city. Right. Um, if you go to um, chapter 17 okay hang on for a moment <clears throat> Is that up now? Does that show 17? Yes. Okay. And uh, it's near the bottom of the chapter. Uh, verse 15. Okay. Now, in the context, um, Is verse 12 says, Yet the children of Manasseh could not drive out the inhabitants of those cities, but the Canaanites would dwell in that land. So it's uh, Manasseh's the sort of context. Yet it came to pass when the children of Israel were waxed and strong, they put the Canaanites to tribute, but did not drive them out utterly, drive them out. And the children of Joseph spake unto Joshua, saying, Why hast thou given me but one lot of the portion to inherit, seeing that I am a great people, for as much as the Lord hath blessed me hitherto? So that could be Manasseh and Ephraim. Sure. In that context, you know. And Joshua answered them, If thou be a great people, then get thee up to the wood country and cut down thyself there in the land of the Perizzites. And of the giants, if Mount Ephraim be too narrow to thee. So, um, so, yeah, it could be Ephraim. Right. Yeah, I'm not sure. But Ephraim, to me, I think is, that you think that, well, that would be the tribe of Ephraim. 
you know, so maybe the map isn't very accurate in that aspect. Well, it's, it, that's a possibility. The thing that, that I'm looking at, um, when I went through the study to prepare for Joshua 21, there's a certain number of cities that are listed according to each tribe. And the consideration would have been that these were the cities that had been appointed to the different tribes, but were then to be secondarily appointed to the Levites. So they were in the list of the 48 cities. And in chapter 21, the sanctuary city that, that we're just addressing right now was listed as coming from Ephraim. Right. Okay. Thanks. You bet. Okay. So. So it's interesting as, as we go through this map, you see here, here is Bezer of Reuben. Mm -hmm. Here is Hebron. We know that Hebron had its name changed. We also know that Hebron was for Caleb. There were other events that took place in Hebron as we would look through the Bible. So these are the furthest south of the sanctuary cities. As we would go a bit north, here you have Shechem, here you have Ramoth Gilead. And then as we go further north from here, we have Golan, and then we have Kadesh. So Kadesh, as it's showing here, will be just will be due south really from this area that Dan chose to take from Naphtali as its inheritance. Mm -hmm. So again, as I was led to prepare for this, I was taking a look at the different um, cities and to whom or from whom these cities were taken. Now, as we look at this, here is Hebron. Hebron is within the tribe of Judah. Judah was the fourth son of Leah. We come over here to Bezer. Reuben was the first son of Leah. We come up here to Shechem. And Shechem, this is listed as coming from Ephraim. So that would have been the second son of Joseph, but that would have been part of the inheritance through Rachel, Raquel. Now, we come over here to Ramoth Gilead. Being of the tribe of Gad would have meant that that would have been through Zilpa, Leah's handmaid, the seventh born son. Golan in Bashan would have been through Manasseh. Again, Raquel. But when we come here to Kadesh, 
that would have been through Bilha or Raquel's handmaid, because that's in the tribe of Naphtali. So what, what was interesting to me is the tribes that were told that they were not going to give up a sanctuary city because Dan, nothing in his territory became a sanctuary city. Issachar, Asher, nothing in their territory became a sanctuary city. Zebulun, no sanctuary city. And Simeon and Benjamin, no sanctuary city. Yet every one of those tribes gave cities to the Levites. So I didn't know if there's something symbolic about this listing or if there's something that, that we should be looking into further for our time. So, sorry for that segue. That's okay. Please continue. Okay, so we can scroll down. Okay. So I think you had already read Deuteronomy. I touched on part of De Deuteronomy, but that would have been Deuteronomy 19, and you're here at Deuteronomy 4. Right, okay. Yeah, so three assigned to the east of the Jordan before the conquest of Canaan in 1493 BC. So we find that in Deuteronomy chapter 4, verses 41 to 43. Moses severed three cities on this side Jordan towards the sun rising, that the slayer might flee thither, which should kill his neighbor unawares, and he did him not in times past, and that fleeing unto one of these cities he might live namely Bezer in the wilderness in the plain country of the Reubenites and Ramoth in Gilead of the Gadites and Golan and Bashan of the Manassanites. Manassanites. And then you read provision made for three cities to be chosen in um, three parts of the land. When the Lord thy God hath cut off the nations whose land the Lord God giveth thee, and thou succeedest them, and dwellest in their cities and in their houses, thou shalt separate three cities for thee in the midst of the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to possess it. Thou shalt prepare thee a way and divide the coasts of thy, of thy land which the Lord thy God giveth thee to inherit into three parts, that the slayer may flee thither. So that, you didn't read that, but that was, uh, so that's going to be when the conquer the west of the Jordan. So these cities are going to be Hebron, Kadesh, and Shechem. And then just scroll down. Yeah. And then we have three extra parts, potentially, sorry, three additional cities. And if the Lord thy God enlarge thy coast as he has sworn unto thy fathers, give thee all the land which he promised to give unto thy fathers, if I will keep all these commands to do them, which I command thee this day, to love thy God, to love the Lord thy God, and to walk in his ways, then thou shalt add three cities more for thee, beside these three. So we have potentially, we have six cities, and but potentially nine. And so I was thinking just that uh, you have that 369 that we find in the, the parable in Matthew 20. And he went out about the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whosoever is right I will give you, and, who, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way, and again he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour, and he did likewise. So as we have the cities being a three, 
an R3, which is six, and then potentially an R3, which is nine. We have these here R's in Matthew uh, chapter 20. And then we have Christ on the cross. And it was in the third hour that they crucified him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. Now that would give us six hours in total. Right. But, but you have there the symbol of the three, six, nine. And then even with the six hours, you have that the, the River Jordan, in a sense, dividing them cities of refuge. And uh, we know that the, when Christ is on the cross, them six hours, that they were divided between three hours where there was light. And then there's three hours where there, there was darkness above around the cross. So uh, you, you can have that. You take that sort of, maybe see some symbolism there as well, just with the six cities. And um, is any other thoughts about that? You know, I, I had never really considered that the, the point that you were making here from Deuteronomy 19, that it was possible that another set of three cities could have been appointed. But the 369 that you're presenting makes logical sense because it gives us a, a symbol. Because here in the parable, there are the workers that begin at the third hour. There are the workers that begin at the sixth. And then, of course, the workers that begin at the ninth hour. And it's comparison with what you're, what you're putting here in Mark, where Jesus was crucified on the third hour. And then when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness. And it lasted until the ninth hour. So when, when there are those that are lifted up at the end, could we say that that is the third hour of the day of God's wrath? And then how do we apply the sixth and the ninth hour for that time? Um, well, we had ideas about the third R representing, well, certainly with the Matthew 20, you have the workers in the vineyard. So the time, the time in the end is the, the first R in a sense when the, the day begins. Right. And the third hour we tied to 9 11, the sixth hour, maybe to midnight, and then the ninth hour, midnight cry, or maybe the Sunday law. And then you have the message goes in to the world, to 11th hour workers, maybe, you know, you can maybe sort of see that sort of symbolism or some thoughts there concerning that. Okay. Um, Um, with the sixth hour, you can maybe parallel the sixth hour with the uh, with midnight. Okay. Uh, even though it's the daytime, but in a sense, there's darkness there. It's sort of in the middle, midway. And then, um, so. We know things are going to get darker from then on in the world as well. That way, Mark. And um, yeah, so I'm not, not too uh, sure how to, to place things at the moment. Okay. I've had thoughts about it. But... Okay, so we'll scroll down. So Golan and Bashan. 
out of the tribe of Manasseh. Yep. So unto the children of Gershon, which means a stranger there, exile, an outcast, of the families of the Levites, of the other half tribe of Manasseh, they gave Golan and Bashan with their suburbs to be a refuge for the slayer. And Bishitera, temple of Astarte, with her suburbs, uh, two cities. So um, Gershon, the Levites, um, will uh, inhabit it. Uh, Golan and First Chronicles 6 verse 71 and unto the sons of Gershon were given out of the family of the half tribe of Manasseh Golan, Bashan with her suburbs then Ashtara again is just like another name for Bishatira so it's the same sort of name of the, the town just maybe like a different way of spelling which means a temple of Ashtarte again with her suburbs and Golan meaning great exodus, exile, their captivity, their rejoicing. And the Strong's has it as just a captive. Right. It's interesting that the Levites would be given this city where there was this temple of Ashtaroth. Mm -hmm. I mean... If they said that they were given the city and the Levites destroyed the Temple of Ashtaroth, I think we could understand that. But this is basically saying that they're given the city and it doesn't say what they did with it. Mm -hmm. So is this is this giving us a an object lesson that these priests of God? these Levites of the children of Gershom were not completely faithful to God's instruction. And that's just, it, it's a thought question. So, okay. Okay. So Ramoth and Gilead. Yep. Gilead, out of the tribe of God. So we have this here. City being mentioned in First Kings chapter 22, verses 1 to 4. And they continued three years without war between Syria and Israel. And it came to pass in the third year that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, came down to the king of Israel. And the king of Israel said unto his servants, O ye that Ramoth and Gilead is ours, and we be still, and take it not out of the hand of the king of Syria. And he said unto Jehoshaphat, Wilt thou go with me to battle to Ramoth Gilead? And Jehoshaphat said to the king of Israel, I am as thy art, my people as thy people, my horses as thy horses. On one occasion, Jehoshaphat visited the king of Israel at Samaria. Special honor was shown the guest, the royal guest from Jerusalem. And before the close of his visit, he was persuaded to unite with the king of Israel in war against the Syrians. Ahab hoped that by joining his forces with the, those of Judah, he might regain Ramoth, one of the cities of refuge, which he contended rightfully belonged to the Israelites. So that's Prophets and Kings, page 195. Well, okay, now just for a second. As, as you're reading this, and I want to return to this very quickly, but as we come back up here to this map, I find it interesting that in the division that had occurred within, with Israel and Judah, would we then say that five of the cities of refuge were within Israel and only one was within Judah? I think that, that would have been the case. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not sure now if these are whether that might have still been in the Judah. I'm not sure. Okay. Later on, we don't know it's because it's kind of a, or maybe Syria may have, maybe have took that or at that time. Okay. I mean, I'm just, I, I'm looking at this with, with the question, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Certainly Shechem, um, Ramath Gilead, well. Well, I mean, we, I think we would agree that we would have Kadesh, Golan, Shechem, that would have been within Israel because they're, they're mentioning some of this. But then they're saying that they had to go to war here over Ramoth Gilead. And okay, if that's if that's the case, it had been part of Israel and they were looking to reclaim the territory. This is not going to expand the territory of Judah. It is going to expand the territory of Ahab, right? Yes. Okay. Okay, so. So we have um, South Ramoth being mentioned in 1 Samuel. Right. And when David came to Ziklag, he sent off the spoil unto the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, the present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord, to them which were in Bethel, and to them which were in South Ramoth, and to them which were in Jatir. Okay. So. I'm not too sure. So he's well, sending it to the elders of Judah. So this may have been an, another Ramoth. So it says South Ramoth, which is potentially another name of the town in uh, Judah, rather than being in Gad. Okay. We know that this is, okay, as, as David is saying this, behold a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of the Lord. So he's given this spoil to those that were in Bethel, the house of the Lord. Ramoth may meaning. I have lofty. Lofty place. Okay. Heights, lofty place, yes. And then we would have Jatir. So. One reference is saying that this was a rest. I'm looking to see what other ones have quickly. I have like a excelling, preeminent, lofty. Okay. Which is quite similar to Rama. Okay, because that was a, a preeminent city in the mountains of Judah. Interesting, all right. So he's sending these, I mean, starting with the house of God. I mean, that's, that, to me, that, that means that we have something of importance for us today. Yeah. Okay. So I'm just wondering whether Bethel would have been in Judah at that time. That's possible. I mean, it, it has a logical note to it. And with what, with what we were addressing here, if we, if we look back at this, I mean,
Because originally it was in Benjamin, and then the time of Judges in Deborah, it was part of Ephraim. Right. And by, by that time, it was very possible that Benjamin could have been, or that which had been Benjamin could have been absorbed pretty much completely within Judah. Mm -hmm. So that makes sense. I mean, Jatir, according to your map, would have been down on the border of Simeon and Judah. If Bethel was part of Judah, and then Ramoth, that's possible that, that there could be a second Ramoth because we're finding so many of these that had multiple names depending on the, on the tribe. Because if he was giving a gift to Ramoth Gilead, that's, that's a city that's pretty far north from everything else because the, the portion that we would be looking at here as Bethel and Jatir are definitely within the, in the areas of Judah. Okay. Uh, and it says South Ramoth, so I'm just thinking. Right. Have the other Ramoth in the north. So I think that's the reason why they call it South. Okay. And then in First Chronicles, we have uh, one of the tribe of Ishikar. Um, and out of the tribe of Ishikar, Kedesh with her suburbs, Dabarath with her suburbs, and Ramoth with her suburbs, and Annem with her suburbs. So that, that could be like another um, city as well, also called Ramoth in Ishikar. Right, because Issachar would have been north of the portion of Manasseh that was assigned to them to the west of the Jordan. Mm -hmm. So that, that would make sense that we're then talking about a third city. Yes. And then we have one of the sons of Bani that uh, came out of Babylon. Right. During the time of Ezra, it was called Ramoth and um, Gilead means perpetual fountain, a heap of testimony, a witness. That's what I have for that. So, normally, does I think you have Ramoth, Gilead normally being mentioned as, as specifying it's the Ramoth that's in Gilead rather than the Ramoth in. Ishikar or the Ramoth in Judea. So I think that's uh, just noting. So Bezer, we don't have a lot of mentions of Bezer. So it's in the wilderness upon the plain out of the tribe of Reuben. And uh, Bezer means gold ore, defense, munitions, and strongs. It's an inaccessible spot. And the uh, First Chronicles mentions of the sons of Zopha. So he was from the tribe of Asher. So you have a Bezer being mentioned there. And other than that, there's no other mention uh, other than its reference to a city of refuge. Okay. So um, Kadesh. In Galilee and Mount Naphtali. So Kadesh means uh, sanctuary, holy place. In Joshua 15, 21, another most tribe of the children of Judah towards the coast of Edom, southward were Kabzil, Edar, Jagur, and Kadesh, and Hazor, and Ithnam. So this would be another Kadesh, I believe, because the other Kadesh is quite north in Naphtali. And this is um, of Edom, southward. So this is dealing with the tribes of Judah. Right. So there's so the name of uh, other cities. And then we have, but we have the Kadesh mentioned in Judges chapter four in the story of Deborah. 
and she sent and called Barak, meaning thunderbolt or lightning, right. the, son of, the son of Abba Abinuam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said unto him, Hath not the Lord God of Israel commanded, saying, Go draw towards Mount Tabor, and take thee three thousand men of the children of Naphtali, and of the children of Zebulun, and I will draw unto thee to the river Kishon Sidera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots and multitude, and I will deliver him into thine hand. And Barak said unto her, I will go if thou wilt. I, if thou wilt go with me, then I will go. If thou wilt not go with me, then I will not go. And she said, I will surely go with thee, notwithstanding the journey that thou takest shall not be for thine honour. For the Lord shall sell, sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. And Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kadesh. And Barak and Zebulun and Naphtali to Kadesh. And he went up with 10,000 men at his feet, and Deborah went with him. Now Heber the Canaanite, which was which was of the children of Hobab, the just have to scroll down. Yep. The father-in-law of Moses had severed himself from the Canaanites and pitched his tent in the plain of Zanaim, which is by Kadesh, and they showed Sisera and Barak, the son of Ab 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 Abinoam, was gone up uh, to Mount Tabor. So that's the other references to Kadesh Naphtali in the Bible. Okay. So I find it interesting. When, when we're going through this portion where it says, now Heber the Kenite, which was of the children of Hobab, the father of Moses, the father-in-law of Moses. So Hobab and Jethro are the same party. But is this a name change or is this a, just an additional name, such as you know, what we would say a middle name or a family name? So as we're looking at these things, we have other details of other items that are being brought forward. So we have Kadesh, the sanctuary that's being addressed. And we're bringing this together because we need to address all of these references that we find within scripture to come to a truer understanding. So there's quite a bit that's been given here about Kadesh in Galilee. So I'm intrigued that we've only seen this in the Old Testament that it does not get mentioned in the New. So that's so what I've got to offer there. Okay, so we come to Shechem in Mount Ephraim. So Shechem I have meaning back shoulder. And in Strong's it means ridge. And we find it in Joshua 17 verse 2. There was a lot for the rest of the children of Manasseh by their families. And for the children of Shechem, these were the male children of Manasseh the sons of Joseph by their families. So the children of Manasseh there is being related to uh, the children of Shechem. So maybe that's why the map has Manasseh identified where Shechem is. Okay. So Jacob came to Shalem, a city of Shechem, which is the, in the land of Canaan, when he came from Pandanaram and pitched his tent before the city. And Dinah, the daughter of Leah, which she bare unto Jacob, 
went out to see the daughters of the land. And when Shechem, the son of Hamor, the Hevite, prince of the country, saw her, he took her and lay with her and defiled her. So, so it sort of mentioned Shalem, a city of Shechem. So it's maybe like a, he, came, he didn't go to Shechem itself, maybe just the border. Or... In, in a situation like that, uh, are we seeing this city named after the son of Hamor, much like Cain named a city after his son? Yes. So that's intriguing that, you know, we're, we're dealing with this and referencing back to the situation with Dinah, because we know what's going to happen with Simeon and Levi once they find out what's going on. Yes. It's also referenced in Genesis 37. So Jacob sent uh, Joseph to Shechem to check on his brothers. And then the, when he came there, he inquired of someone and, and um, they said, they've passed on to Dathan. Right. Just to just pass through Shechem. And then Numbers 26, of the sons of Manasseh, of Machir, Machir begat Gilead, and of Gilead come the family of the Gileadites. These are the sons of Gilead, Shechem. So this is a, another Shechem, one of the sons of Gilead. Right. So not really really, really to the city, other than... Um, well, he certainly wasn't the cause of the city being named Shechem, but uh, he sort of named after the city. So maybe that's another reason why you would maybe play Shechem and Manasseh from that verse. It's also, it's also interesting that we have Makir being referenced here because that's the, the son of Manasseh that was raised upon Joseph's knee. Correct. Okay. Verse 1 of chapter 24. And Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the, el and called for the elders of Israel and for their heads and for their judges and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. So that's Joshua's last sermon is given and shaken to the tribes. And then verse 32, and the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, buried they in Shechem, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem, for a hundred pieces of silver. And it became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. So Joseph, he was then buried in Shechem, but then you had um, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were being buried in Hebron. I don't know if there's any. Just, um, I thought maybe you would think Joseph would have been buried with his father, um, but he chose to be buried in the, well, whether he, I don't know whether he chose, but they chose to bury him, bury him there and shake him rather than in Hebron. Well, we know that Jacob buried Raquel near Bethlehem. Yes. Shechem was a, a plot of land that was purchased by Jacob. And was that not where he buried Leah? That could have been, yes. I mean, I'm, I'm, sure. I'm thinking that became kind of the family plot for 
lack okay. of a better word. Mm -hmm. But then you would think, why not bury Jacob there? Well, we'd, we'd have to look in, into that a little, a little deeper. Maybe we could do that first thing in the morning. So please continue with what you've got. Okay, we have Shechem being mentioned in Judges 8, verse 30. You had uh, Abimelech, the, the son of Gideon, by a concubine. And um, so the, the concubine was in Shechem, and she bare him a son and named him, and whose name was called Abimelech. And then we, he went to Shechem unto his mother's brethren and communed with them, with all the family of the house of the mother's father, saying, Speak, I pray thee, in the ears of all the in the ears of all the men of Shechem, whether it is better for you either that all the sons of Jerubal, which are three score and ten persons, reign over you, or one reign over you. Remember that I am your bone and flesh, and your mother's brethren speak of him in the ears of the, all the men of Shechem, all these words in their hearts inclined to full Abimelech. And they said, he is our brother, and they gave him three score and ten pieces of silver out of the house of Balbirath, wherewith Abimelech hired vain and light persons which followed him. And then you have the story where uh, he fights with the, the people of Abimelech, or sorry, the people of Shechem get fed up with him. And then he fights against the city of Shechem. And he kills a thousand people in a tower in that city and then moves on to another place. And then a woman throws a tile off a roof and kills him um, in another city. So we have that there, just sort of uh, referencing that story uh, that we find there in Judges briefly. And then in 1 Kings chapter 12, Rehoboam went to Shechem. For all Israel were come up to Shechem to make him king. Then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. So this is like a Jeroboam must have probably say better to say rebuilt Shechem. Um, so this is where the kingdom was divided after Solomon died. And then so... Scroll down, just hang us. So we have a few more references there. Shall we just finish there? Or sure. just so it's interesting that here with Rehoboam that they went to Shechem for all Israel came to Shechem to make him king. Mm -hmm. And then Jeroboam built Shechem in Mount Ephraim and dwelt therein. And then you have, you have this reference from Psalm 60 and also Psalm 108.8. God has spoken in his holiness. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and meet out the valley of Sukkoth. So that was potentially a Psalm of David. I haven't actually checked okay. whether it was David. Well, why... Why don't we, we will return to this then tomorrow morning and then finish the balance of the study. Right, okay. Okay? Yes. So any other thoughts or comments today? Any questions? I appreciate the work these presenters are doing to put together these Misinformation. There's quite a bit that's gone into this. Yes, I agree. Okay. So, brothers and sisters, shall we close with prayer? Gracious Father, we thank you for this time that we've spent together. We thank you for the many lessons that you are teaching us 
and in the way that you are using these that are presenting. Direct us today, be with us each one. May your will be done, may your character be shown to all of those with whom we come in contact. Thank you, Father, for these blessings. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this opportunity that we've had to draw closer to you. Guide us through this day. For this, we thank you. And for this, we praise you. Now and always, in Jesus' name, amen.